I started my career in the early 1990s at Solomon Brothers on the mortgage trading desk. Um, spent some time at uh, Credit Suisse. I was at UBS for a number of years. And then prior to launching Hollis Park, uh, I spent seven years at Deutsche Bank um, running various portions of their uh, mortgage trading team, culminating with running uh, RMBS trading uh, <clears throat> globally. So that, um, you know, that lends itself to kind of what Hollis Park is and, and the fact that we are a structured product focused alternative asset manager with, uh, you know, a few vehicles. But I think the key thing to take away from that is, uh, you know, I've been 27 years in the mortgage market. Um, there's very little style drift. If you look at the uh, entire investment committee, everybody is sort of a mortgage or a structured product specialist. We have sort of three distinct buckets that we invest in across the structured product universe. The first being structured rates, which is agency mortgages, spec pools, curve, vol. And that serves as the alpha in our portfolio, i.e. when volatility goes up, that, that book should perform well. Um, we also have a structured credit book, which is anything without a Freddie Fannie or Ginny Rapper, we consider structured credit. And so that talks about uh, RMBS, CMBS, CLOs, down to the sort of the bottom of the capital structure as far as equity. Uh, we consider that all credit. And we consider that the beta in our portfolio in large correlation to other beta products. Now, let's be clear, there are alpha, there's alpha within the beta and one, the underwriting, and two, the timing. But at the end of the day, we recognize that credit bucket to be beta. And then we also have a structured derivatives bucket, which is agency, inversile, IO, and PL. And that's sort of the porridge in between the alpha and the beta. Um, and the reason that we kind of broke those out in that way is we want to be very <clears throat> particular around where we have our exposures at particular times and, ask, and actually do the asset allocation between those three buckets in a dynamic way, depending on where we see obviously big macro events, but also where do we see sort of boots on the ground value within those two sectors. And in doing that, what we've tried to do is create a durable investment process. When you think about alpha, you think about volatility going up. When you think about beta, you think about low volatility, right? Intrinsically, historically, beta products have performed well when volatility is tremendously low and have underperformed when volatility starts to really creep up. So when you get six, seven standard deviation moves such that we had in March, they're gonna be very, very difficult periods for, for credit, but intrinsically it should be very, very good periods for the alpha portion or the rates portion of our portfolio. And we think, if you overlay that with the concept of what is liquid and what isn't liquid in today's day and age, you can kind of create the durability that I'm talking about. And so big picture, when you have big moves, these books can serve as hedges to each other. So it minimizes your drawdown exposure. Um, and at the same time, it also somewhat limits the scenario of us making 30 or 40%, like you, know, you saw in the rebound of the credit unwinding in 2010 and 2011 where you had several structured product funds make 30, 40% in a year, that probably conceptually won't be us as well because we're not invested in 100% beta. And so I think through, through those mechanisms and the asset allocation and the deep dive that we do at the grassroots of each one of these product sets, we can create a durability that's sort of longer lasting than I think a lot of the other firms that you may compare us to. There's not a huge footprint in the hedge fund space. And quite honestly, the dealer community has lowered their exposure in a $7 trillion market, right? So the opportunity set just from the players that were in it, let's say four or five years ago to the players that are in it now is intrinsically higher because there's just less people willing to commit capital risk, balance sheet, however you want to look at it. So what does that mean for Hollis Park? Well, what do we consider our specialty is is in the agency or the rates book, we try to buy collateral or pools of mortgages that are gonna prepay slower than the model's expectations. And we try to hedge them with cheapest to deliver or TBA forward contracts on 
collateral that we think are going to prepay faster than the market. Our track record has proven, particularly in the race book, that we're pretty good at it. And so, you know, we, we challenge ourselves around that. We try to stay dynamic in how we're looking at it. And part of the secret sauce in that, right, is intrinsically if I'm buying something that's prepaying slower and I'm hedging it with somebody, something that's prepaying faster, I have a duration drift at play. And how I go about hedging that excess duration is part of the secret sauce of what we do at Hollis Park and what I think we've done well over the last almost six years at this point. So all those things kind of dovetail into what I think will be a robust opportunity within the structured rates book because of you know the metrics that I talked about. One, low interest rates for a long period of time with very little correlation to sort of other product sets uh, from a returns perspective. Uh, <clears throat> two, forbearance and what the knock-ons will be and that's sort of a little longer term opportunity set. And then thirdly, um, the interest rate and prepay models consistently being off. And I don't think that that changes because what we found is they're based tremendously off of a regression process. And given where we are in sort of uncharted waters with regards to interest rates, mortgage rates, um, what the consumer and homeowner are doing with their capital, technology, and I didn't talk about that, but that's something that's really kind of starting to play a real meaningful role with regard to new financing. All those things are hard for the models to really track and understand. And as a result, it creates this model error. And that's, I think, where, you know, firms like Hollis Park can really sort of step up and make a difference from a returns perspective. Some of them are simplistic in nature. So, uh, you know, I always try to provide for instances. So one of the model errors was, you know, we had HARP, which is a program that helped homeowners refinance, you know, for a number of years through the crisis. And one of the trades that we put on, we bought a bunch of pre-HARP premium mortgages. And our premonition is once HARP slowed, uh, once HARP ended, prepays on those securities would drop 20 to 30% in large part because those homeowners who are in a 5.5% mortgage that they bought in 2008, 2009 and hadn't refinanced, there was something that was impeding that process, either their credit or more likely than not, they were just comfortable with paying their eight or $900 a month in mortgage payment and didn't want to be bothered with the paperwork, right? Um, but one of the things that the model was making a mistake of because they didn't have what forward guidance looked like is they had HARP in their prepaid models in perpetuity. Knowing that HARP was ending, but they didn't know what to put in its place. And so there was this model error that was right there for everybody to see that nobody really paid attention to that intrinsically, you know, if, if the person's not getting a call every week, prepaid should slow down. And so we were able to buy a bunch of pre-HARP bonds based off of these long-term prepaid projections, projections from the models. Um, and when HARP ended, these bonds slowed down actually we thought seeing opportunity and why the models are not catching it um, is because these are evolving processes. And quite honestly, the information that you're getting is an evolving one. So it's, it's, it's a process where you need to be dynamic and, and active. And I think, you know, the models have struggled over the last three years to kind of keep up. One of the things that COVID has done, right, it is fast forward in our opinion, technology. And what does technology mean to the consumer? What does technology mean to um, business place? Uh, what does technology mean on the forwards of so many different things? And one of the things I think that's pretty evident in the fact that we're doing a Zoom call and productivity for financial institutions to remain relatively well is that maybe the whole concept of having everybody in the office or needing every single uh, employee in the office is one that will be challenged on a go forward basis. And I think as people try to identify uh, how do I cut costs, how do I keep savings? Well, part of that will be small office footprint over time, particularly once we get a vaccination. And then the other part of it is, um, well, I can kind of create a lower cost structure because now I can allow a lot of my employees to work from areas that are far less expensive. And as a result, I can sort of save some some cash that way as well. So I think the CMBS space is one that is still probably the most nebulous and you know has some great opportunity. We just just finished sort of pricing a CLO deal where you know we uh, we bought some of the um, 
triple B minuses and the triple Bs. And we think that these are 17, 18% IRR trades, even as the equity market is sort of retraced back to its highs and most of the credit indices are back to or close to their highs. I look at that sector as one that's ripe with opportunity. I think you need to be diligent and thoughtful and it isn't one size fits all in any way, shape or form. And the, the concept of just closing your eyes and buying anything like you could do in 2008, 2009, I think are dramatically different. Uh, and this will be a bond pickers market as opposed to a sector market. But I think the opportunity set broadly is, is really, really good. One of the things we learned very dramatically in March, and I'm really proud of our infrastructure middle office team and how we were able to handle what was a very volatile time with regard to financing, and cash, and cash management. We're proud. We were not forced to sell any security in the month of March and or April as a cash raising exercise. But one of the things we learned is cash and what cash means in crisis time. And while we were able to sort of make sure, and as I said, we do, we run no duration drifts. So when we were margin called on one side, we were able to margin call people on the other side uh, and match those margins and actually make payments back and forth between multiple entities. But one of the things we learned is Hollis Park is pretty low on people's list of people to pay when times get hard. And so coming out of that, one of the things we said is we've got to make the firm better. And what did we learn from March? Because if we didn't learn anything and make ourselves better, then there's really nothing gained. And we've hired a firm by the name of AVM, which is an aggregator of allocated allocations. And so what they do is they take a bunch of smaller firms and they create this big balance sheet. So now all of a sudden when they call their cash, you have to pay attention because they're a bigger aggregate, you know, counterparty to you. Um, and so we've employed them to now help us with the cash management. Now we still have very, very hands-on process internally, but we now have sort of big brother helping us out in times of stress and, and, and despair around when we get our cash and how we get our cash in a timely fashion so we can make payment and we don't have uh, any issues with regard to credibility. I think the opportunity in the Opportunities Fund is the greatest in large part because all three underlying sectors actually are, are pretty good opportunities right now. All three have their own intrinsic opportunities to actually create real value for the investors. Um, and so I think that broad-based approach here and now over a six to 12 month period makes a ton of sense for me. you should expect some normalization of returns. We've caught some big movements in the liquidity fund. A lot of funds are vintage relative. So the vintage, at least at the beginning of this fund, um, was a good one. I would say, you know, what we were trying to kind of achieve with Siddharth and I when sort of first started noodling this around was, you know, somewhere between 50 to 60 basis points a month. I think that's still, the expectation on a go forward basis, but I, I would, you know, I would say this: the election is is the wild card, and we could experience a tremendous amount of volatility with regard to the election. But if we don't get that volatility, I would say we will moderate back into sort of the fifty to sixty basis points. I still think there's tons of opportunity. I, I wouldn't expect a massive pullback. I just think the months of making a percent to a percent and a half have been predicated on like big vol moves or big coupon swap moves that we've actually caught right you know for a very for various reasons but if we sort of sink ourselves back into what normally you see on a month in and month out basis i think we have 50 to 60 basis points to be made 